Good morning. So I'm going to trick you, Bill. There's no page 42 today. No page 42, so you can put your books away. But let's begin in prayer. Lord, let me quote from your book. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll see if this works. How big it does. So I do a lot of Via de Cristos and Brothers in Blues, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So we begin with pictures of our family, and it does a couple of things. It provides a nice transition, but also provides the speaker a chance to calm down. And we do that. We have a wide range of people that have different comfort levels. And I said, well, the one thing you can talk about is probably yourself. You really can't get that wrong. So stand up there and say something about yourself. So my name is Larry Labinus. I live in Boone, Iowa. I am the statewide coordinator for the Brothers in Blue Prison Ministry. We now are running 13 weekends in the state of Iowa in seven different prisons. And so what is a Brothers in Blue? Well, if you've been to a Vita Cristo or a Crescio or a walk to Emmaus, it is the same thing. But we do it inside the prison. And a number of you have been with me in those events. And so I coordinate those activities for the state. It's doing very, very well, and I would say that we're reaching somewhere around 500 to 600 inmates per year in these prisons, and we just finished one last weekend in Clorinda, and we have not been there since 2002, so it was a big blessing to be back there after 16 years of absence. Actually, one of the guys came up and he said, I was there in 2002, so he's been sitting in Clorinda for the last 16 years. I also am going hiking next weekend with my son-in-law, which is in the back here, and hopefully I survived that trip. Um, there's been thoughts that I'm in the worst shape I've been in a long time, so I'm just letting you know that I'm not ready, Kyle, and I'll probably end up just falling down under a tree or something. I brew beer. Um, my wife, I'll get later on my story, my wife says, you need to have a hobby. So I thought, well, I like drinking beer, and I'm cheap. <laughs> so I put those two together, and now I brew beer at home, and I brewed 10 gallons yesterday. It was a nice adventure. I'm also a partial owner in a local brewery, the Boone Valley Brewery. So if you're down in Boone, come down and see us in Boone sometime The Boone v at the BVB. It's my wife, Cindy. She's in the back there. This is a picture we took. I'm big into selfies. My daughters can't stand it. Um, I, post, I actually do it now just to annoy them. I don't even like doing it, but I do it just to annoy them now because that's fun. We had tie-dye shirts. Um, I took this picture because it'll probably be the only chance I'll ever wear that shirt. Um, I'm not a color person, and that shirt had a lot of color in it. My wife works at a various places. She works at Ames Christian School with children, and she does a lot of stuff with kids. We've got grandkids I'll show pictures of. We stay active with our grandchildren. Speaking of grandchildren, this is my daughter, Bethany. She's in the lower corner. Her husband, Josh, is with the dead animal up in the upper corner. He kills stuff all the time, and uh, turkeys, deer, whatever. I went over to their house the other day, and they don't have a swimming pool, but my grandchildren were actually in two big tubs uh, sticking their faces in there and acting like they were snorkels so they were breathing through those straws. <laughs> and Olivia, in her genius, didn't think the straws had to stick up, so they were sticking in the water when she took a breath. <laughs> and she discovered that was a bad idea. Later on, they, Josh told him that those are the two tubs he hauls around raw meat in from that same deer from the other picture. Didn't stop either one of them. They just went back underwater and gave it another run. Uh, they live in Boone, so it's great to have them local with us. Um, Josh works for Fairway, and Bethany works at the school as a cook at a local Christian school. You recognize this family. Part of them are here. We went to family camp. That's where that shirt came from. This is a picture from family camp. Um, they're in the back. Kyle works for uh, Indian Motorcycles, and Jamie has her own education center with children. They're great with kids. We had a great time at family camp. It's the first time we went. But as you can see, family camp went a real little awry by the end. Um, is the other picture of Miles up there? Yeah. So within the Lauren, uh, granddaughter, uh, fell on this first morning and had stitches over her eye. And by Wednesday, Miles had been able to break his arm and in the gym. So we had two broken bones. So it was quite a week. I asked Jamie, do you want to go home? And she goes, we are going to survive family camp if it kills all of them. <laughs> so we went to family camp and continued the week. As you can see, it was, a, it was a good time, but it had some challenges. My son Tyler lives in Chicago. He is a theater education teacher at a high school there starting this fall. 
I'm very proud of what he's going to do out there for that school. He's a great education. He loves working with children. They get all of that from their mother, not from me. <clears throat> I'm pretty good with kids, but not that good. Um, so today's sermon, God's plan for you. So I'll just give you a little topic about what my sermons are like. This is going to be, I've got a topic, you've got it right here, I'll tell a few points, I'll tell a few stories, and I'll finish with a visual, and the, a visual and something for you to do. There will be a commercial at about 12 minutes, because that's about how long we can last, and um, that's about best of your attention. So hang on, it's a pretty quick sermon. So the verse for today, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And that, we heard that earlier during the lesson, the Old Testament lesson, Jeremiah 29, 11. During this sermon series, you finally come to this verse, 29, 11. This is one of the most beloved verses in the Bible. I've heard this verse quoted. I've seen it on signs. I've seen it on posters and plaques, living rooms, T-shirts, everywhere. Many Christians commit these words to memory. We inscribe them on graduation cards. We share them with those who are sick, those who are discouraged in some sort of difficult situation. For many people, this might be the only verse they know in Jeremiah. Believe it or not, there's a website called topverses.com that rates every verse in the Bible by popularity, by total, by book, by topic, and, well, a whole bunch of other ways. Not surprisingly, John 3.16 is number one. John 1.1 1, 1 is number two, and that's in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God, was with God and was God. Number three is a favorite of mine, again from John 14.6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, Jeremiah 29.11 is ranked horribly low at 29 of all the verses in the Bible, which is really not too bad. We you wonder how many verses are there in the Bible. Anybody have an idea? I had to look it up. I had no idea. 31,102, so being at 29 is pretty good. So rightfully, so because it's such a powerful and wonderful verse that believers have claimed for hundreds or even thousands of years, it's been a lifeline, especially for those going through hard times. However, we, will now properly under, we cannot properly understand this verse unless we know something about its background. You heard that in the story today. The single most important fact is that it was written to the Jews exi Jewish exiles in Babylon who have been forcibly removed from Jerusalem by King Nebuchadnezzar. Having been uprooted from all their, they held dear, they now lived hundreds of miles away from home, from which in today's terms is like another country. It's forever. And they were living in, that, living in the very heart of not just another country, but of the worldly pomp and pagan idol worship. All their dreams and hopes had vanished. They were smashed, really. Can you imagine? This has to be very similar. I was thinking it has to be very similar to the Jewish occupation or Jewish situation in World War II, being forcibly removed and now just looking out and thinking deep inside and wondered, how could God have let this happen? If we are truly his people, how did we end up here? And they wondered, if God had forgotten them, in all their confusion and despair, they made two very human mistakes. They thought they could or should have never ended up in Babylon. That led them to false confidence. We can't be here no matter what we do. The other one, they thought they would never get out of Babylon. That led them to despair, to face the same danger as we. See, there it goes. So two things here we're going to talk about. Expecting what God has never promised, and the other one is refuse to believe what he has promised. Our danger from Jeremiah 29 is that we will quote it without considering its context. We have all heard it said, when you hit rock bottom, there's nothing to do but look up. But thanks be to God, it is a message of enormous hope. And as we think about this verse, let's go to the first of the two points, expecting what God has never promised. So to look at that, I want to look at what God has promised. Here is something to think about. God will not always do what we expect him to do, but he'll always do what he says he will do. So let's look at God, what God says he will do. God is thinking about us all the time. He says in the passage, I know the thoughts that I think toward you. God thinks about us. Can you even fathom that? I know I, know I can't. 
I can't get my arms around that at all. This may be the most important statement you'll ever hear today. The God of the universe thinks about you, me, all of us. The creator of, of all there is considers us. He knows us. He remembers us. He keeps us in mind. He knows who we are and where we are. Not for the second are we ever lost or forgotten, for his heart is so big and his knowledge is so vast that no one ever gets lost in the shuffle. And with that, another point is that God never forgets his children. You are precious in his sight. The Jews, needed, the Jews really needed to know this because they were in exile in Babylon, far from their home, carried against their will, held against their will under the absolute power of this Babylon king and able, and able to do only what he permitted them to do. God has just said, you'll be returning home in 70 years. That was in verse 10, which was good news and bad news because it meant that they wouldn't be in Babylon forever, but it also meant that they would be there for 70 years. And God says, you think I've forgotten about you. You know that you are here because you forgot me. And it's true that I am punishing you for your own disregard of my commands. But my punishment is not to dis diminish my affection for you. You are forever in my thoughts. You are still my people. I have not forgotten you. Sometimes it's really hard to put these words in the same sentence. I am punishing you, and that does not diminish my affection for you. That sort of doesn't make any sense, does it? So I was thinking about that in some human examples, and I thought about times when my kids were small. It seems in a small way that I needed to help in making them understand by some sort of punishment. However, that did not decrease my love or affection for them. Of course not. It showed them that I cared. If I didn't care, I would have done nothing and let them grow up and just be horrible. But I did care and said something, just like God did here. He cared enough for correction, and well, with God, you get 70 years in the corner, and with kids, you get seven minutes in the corner. God's thoughts towards us are good. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. It's not enough to know that God is thinking of us. We need to know that he is thinking. We need to know what he is thinking. In this case, he makes it very clear. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. We will never fully understand Jeremiah 29, 11 if we think it is kind of a divine rabbit's foot to protect us from pain or to keep us from suffering. Remember that this verse was given to the Jews while they were in Babylon to give them hope that they were not forgotten and that the Babylon would not last forever. It is not a get out of Babylon free card. The verse would provide great encouragement to the Jews. So let's recap. I sent you to Babylon. I'm thinking about you while you're in Babylon. I have never forgotten you in Babylon. I am with you in Babylon. I will give you a future in Babylon. I will bring you home from Babylon. Mostly it is God's way of saying, I still love you, even though you have blown it badly. I still have great plans for you in the future, and the future starts now. Well, 70 years from now. What is God trying to do when he allows his children to go through hard times and deep suffering? You know, I wish I knew the answer to that question, but I don't. I have absolutely no idea. I am not God, and he is. So it really comes down to knowing what, that he is God, and I am not. It's a simple, it's that simple. Don't look for any more. God intends to give us a future filled with hope, to give you a future and a hope. I was fascinated as I read and prepared for this sermon that some Bible versions say to give you an expected end. That's actually a good way to translate the Hebrew. God is not just giving a vague promise that things are going to be better sometime, somewhere in, in some situation. That's true, of course, but this verse was a very specific focus. God has an intended end for his people, and nothing will hinder them from reaching that appointed end. Though they could not see it, they could not see it held on under the Babylon domination. Seventy years down the road, the same God will raise up that raised up this king, Nebuchadnezzar, to judge them, will raise up another pagan king called Cyrus to deliver them. And neither pagan king were, was aware of God's plan. Each man acted what he thought was according to his own free will. And God worked through these kingly decisions to bring his children home. The end they expected will come, though not exactly as they expected it. 
and again, not for 70 years. They will see the end that God always intended. God has no unfinished plans. They will see what God intended from the beginning. Seen in that light, Jeremiah 29, 11 becomes a great comfort, especially when we are going through really hard times. It teaches us that God thinks of us, that his thoughts towards us are good, and then his purposes have been completed, and, will, and, and he will bring troubles, bring us out of troubles to his appointed end. This is hope and future that we need. So this next one, our first point, was expecting what God has never promised. This is only the second point, so two points is all to remember. Now we're going to look at the second point, refusing to believe what he has promised or trust in what he has promised. How are you on trust? Or should I say your loss of control? There's a profound impact. You think about that video, you know, she leaned back and she, you think about trust. The first fall she was like watching him, wasn't she? And she fell back and he caught her, excited. But did she really trust him? You know, I can see a little myself in that lady. I do a little trusting when it meets my needs, or when I don't think it's going to be that big a deal and doesn't seem too radical. But when God wants me to really trust him and go beyond what I think is even possible, is he going to like run around and catch me? You know, how's that going to work, you know? I don't do it, I walk away. And I think a lot of us get caught in that. So, just like that lady there, that's not for me. I'm going on without God, she says. Of the universe in my corner, and I'm going to do this alone. You think about that. How can that even make sense? So my story, a brief story here. I was going to tell my story about Pioneer, because it was on June 13, 2014, that I uh, was called into the office, and they said, today's your last day. I'd spent almost 30 years giving my life to this company. And my kids would know that. I was gone all the time. Uh, you know, I'm not saying they didn't provide, they did that, but I gave my life to that company, and we probably all had those times when that company was probably your God, and that was. I thought about it, slept about it, dreamed about it, did all kinds of stuff for that company, and that God went, you're done, you're out today. I was going to tell that story today, but this last week has been a real beating for me. Uh, a very close friend of mine, my brother's in blue partner, Paul Abbott, and I were down in Clorinda last week. And as we're getting ready, we got the first talk done for Brothers in Blue. And in walks the guard, comes to me. I was leading the weekend, and he says, where's Haley Abbott? And I said, well, she's right over there. You know, I'm thinking, well, what's a big deal? He goes, she has a phone call. Nobody calls the prison to go, hey, things are really great at home. I said, Paul, your wife's got a phone call. So he went running in the back to the captain's office. They were on the phone for about a minute, I'm guessing. I don't even know. I watched them. And they went sprinting out of the prison. And later on, we found out that his daughter, her daughter, had been in a car accident outside of Lamar's. Very serious one. She had been life flighted to Sioux City. And then later, life flighted to Omaha with critical condition. Now, here's the weird part is that they're sitting down in Clorinda. If you know where that's at, we're about an hour from Omaha. So en route, they get another phone call, skip Sioux City, go to Omaha. They get to Omaha in front of the helicopter from Sioux City. They meet him. They see their daughter, Daisy. And as she comes in, she's looking at them, and she squeezes their hand. She squeezes their hands. She goes into surgery and does not survive. 16-year-old daughter, been driving for three months. She's their life. And ironically, even in those times of desperation, do you still trust? I think about that is that if they would have been at home, they would have missed that squeeze. There's no way they could have gotten there before surgery from Rockwell City. But they got there. So God was intervening. We had the funeral last Wednesday with... I don't know how many people there. It was packed. They were like sitting outside. And I watched this gal's, I watched Haley, this gal's mother, stand up with her arms out singing songs. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. That's trust. That's falling backwards when nobody's there. 
I would have rather been in no other place. You know, Steve's part of that group. I would have rather been in no other place that weekend. If I had been at home, I'd have been in a mess. Because they went home that Friday morning at 3 a.m. without their daughter. And I would have been a disaster at home. But I was surrounded by my brothers in Christ, the 23 guys and gals that were there, and surrounded by 64 inmates that were prayer warriors. These guys were unbelievable. They didn't know these people. They prayed for them like you wouldn't believe. One guy walked up and handed me. He goes, I, I did this watercolor. It's the only one I've ever done. It was unbelievable. And it rose. He goes, I want you to have it. Give it to them. They were giving possessions that they, it was their life, giving those things up, praying continuously, writing notes of encouragement. And I would have rather been in no other place than in prison at that moment. One of the other oddities that God plans as we go through that is that the chaplain for the Clorinda prison was the, his brother is the one that read the scripture at the funeral. He's the youth director at that same church. So we're getting, we're getting connected with the brothers. So we have a connection now with that Clorinda prison that's unbelievable. Daisy's death was for, not for, it hurt, but it was not for nothing. It was for something. God has a plan no matter what it is. So, what then? What should we say in response of all this? Our first and greatest need is to submit ourselves to our Heavenly Father and say very simply, Lord, you know even though I don't know. You see what is ahead even when it's very dark for me. You have a purpose even when my life seems to be going in circles and it seems to be falling into a pit, like for my friends, Paul and Haley. For I see that nothing is happening to me that has not come to me by chance. I bow down before you and say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Surely we all need to pray that every single day. In this, if this verse is true, then our position ought to be one of ever-increasing hope in the Lord. I admit that it's hard to do when you see that as a child has died in an auto accident. We all, fall, we all live in a fallen world. We ourselves are fallen people. Not yet, but we are, could be and should be, someday will be. There is no Bible verse that can take away the pain of this world. Jeremiah 29, 11 leads us out of darkness into light. Ironically, that verse is Paul's, Abbott's life verse. And I just, every time I hear that verse now, I'm going to be thinking of that moment. For fear not, child of God, no one knows what a day may bring. Who knows if we will make it through this week or even get home. But our God is faithful to keep every one of us in his promises Nothing can happen to us except as first pass through the hands of our loving God. So what will happen? So what happens post this verse? So what happened after this whole thing? Look it up in Daniel. And you can read about how Daniel, about what happened with them and this king. And how this king, Nebuchadnezzar, went a little goofy. God kind of had him living out in the woods eating all kinds of funny stuff. And how he eventually came to the God of the Jews. So eventually, what goes around comes around. So this is the big finish. Time's up. So what do I do this week with this message? I'm going to leave you two things today, well, maybe three. One is an exercise, and the other I'm going to have a video. I want you to take some time this week to really think about your Babylon. What's got you in captivity? What's got you in the corner? What's got you in band bondage? And what do you need to be delivered from? When you think of it, you think of that thing, pray for it. Pray for that direction and confirmation. Whatever that thing may be that's keeping you from falling backward while you're looking at the Lord and falling backward. What's that thing that keeps you from that? I want you to write that down on a piece of paper. And I want you to put it in your Bible at Psalm 23. That's also part of the assignment. I want you to read Psalm 23. And I want you to do this for the next 21 days, three weeks. They say if you do something for 21 days, it becomes a habit. So pray over that thing that's keeping you from falling backward without, while you're still looking at Jesus. Then I want you to read Psalm 23 and pray. It doesn't have to be a long one. It has to be one you feel. A prayer, not of deliver, a prayer of deliverance from trust. I trust you completely, Lord, and I'm ready to fall backward, just like that lady in the video didn't want to do. The other has become a song that's somehow beaten into my head. It's a video from Toby Mac. It's a little radical probably for, the, for you guys, but I'm going to do it anyway. All I need is you. 
And if you listen to some of this modern Christian music, it's pretty amazing. You can look it up on YouTube. So I want you to do is look it up and listen to it. And let these words fill your head. Because there was times during this week when all that I could hear was that song. So quiet yourself. Play this song. You know how sometimes you get a song stuck in your head and it won't go away? Let this be that song. The song qu quotes the 23rd Psalm, and it's extremely powerful. I can tell you this, Pat, like I said, is all I, all I could hear this week. So, recheck. Here's your things. What's keeping you from falling backwards while you're staring at Jesus? What do you got to give up? Write it down, put it in your Bible in Psalm 23. Spend the next 21 days reading Psalm 23 and praying over that thing that's keeping you from doing that. And if you get time, watch this video. Um, it's powerful as well about trusting in the Lord. Amen.